Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, I have been uh, <coughs> reporting to the president, been meeting with the secretary of state, the vice president, the secretary of defense, chairman of the joint chiefs, and other senior officials. And uh, I'm meeting with you today because we wanted to give you an account of the negotiations as they stand today. I'm sure you will appreciate that I cannot go into the details of particular issues, but I will give you as fair and honest a description of the general trend of the negotiations as I can. First, let me do this in three parts. What led us to believe at the end of October that peace was imminent? Second, what has happened since? Third, where do we go from here? At the end of October, we had just concluded three weeks of negotiations with the North Vietnamese. As you all know, on October 8th, the North Vietnamese presented to us a proposal, which, as it later became elaborated, appeared to us to reflect the main principles that the president has always enunciated as being part of the American position. These principles were that there had to be an unconditional release of American uh, prisoners throughout Indochina. Secondly, that there should be a ceasefire in Indochina brought into being by various means suitable to the conditions of the country's concern. Third, that we were prepared to withdraw our forces under these conditions in a time period to be mutually agreed upon. Fourth, that we would not prejudge the political outcome of the future of South Vietnam. We would not impose a particular solution. We would not insist on our particular solution. The agreement, as it was developed during October, seemed to us to reflect these principles precisely. Then towards the end of October, we encountered a number of difficulties. <coughs> now at the time, because we wanted to maintain the atmosphere leading to a rapid settlement, we mentioned them at our briefings, but we did not elaborate on them. But let me sum up what the uh, problems were at the end of October. It became apparent that there was, in preparation, a massive communist effort to launch an attack throughout South Vietnam to begin several days before the ceasefire would have been declared and to continue for some weeks after the ceasefire came into being. Second, there was an interview by the North Vietnamese Prime Minister, which <coughs> implied that the political solution that we had always insisted was part of our principles, namely that we would not impose a coalition government, was not as clear-cut as our record of the negotiations indicated. And thirdly, as no one could miss, we encountered some specific objections from uh, Saigon. In these conditions, we proposed to Hanoi that there should be one other round of negotiations to clear up these difficulties, we were convinced that with goodwill on both sides, these difficulties 
could be relatively easily surmounted. And that if we conducted ourselves on both sides in the spirit of the October negotiations, a settlement would be very rapid. It was our conviction that if we were going to bring to an end 10 years of warfare, we should not do so with an armistice, but with a peace that had a chance of lasting. And therefore, we proposed three categories of clarifications in the agreement. First, we wanted the uh, so-called linguistic difficulties cleared up so that they would not provide the seed for unending disputes and another eruption of the war. I will speak about those in a minute. Secondly, the agreement always had provided that international machinery be put in place immediately after the ceasefire was declared. We wanted to spell out the operational meaning of the word immediately by developing the protocols that were required to bring the international machinery into being simultaneously with the ceasefire agreement. This to us seemed a largely technical matter. And thirdly, we wanted some reference in the agreement, however vague, however elusive, however indirect, which did not, <coughs> which would make clear that the two parts of Vietnam would live in peace with each other and that neither side would impose its solution on the other by force. These seem to us modest requirements, relatively easily achievable. Let me now tell you the sequence of events since that time. We all know of the disagreements that have existed between Saigon and Washington. These disagreements are to some extent understandable. It is inevitable that a people on whose territory the war has been fought and that for 25 years has been exposed to devastation and suffering and assassination would look at the prospects of a settlement in a more <coughs> in a more detailed way and in a more anguished way than we who are 10,000 miles away. Many of the provisions of the agreement inevitably were seen in a different context in Vietnam than in Washington. And I think it is safe to say that we face with respect to both Vietnamese parties this problem. The people of Vietnam, North and South, have fought for so long that the risks and perils of war, however difficult, seem sometimes more bearable to them than the uncertainties and the risks and perils of peace. Now, it is no secret either that the United States has not agreed with all the objections that were raised by Saigon. In particular, the United States position with respect to the ceasefire had been made clear in October 1970. It had been reiterated in the President's proposal of January 25th 1972. It was repeated again in the President's proposal of May 8, 1972. 
none of these proposals had asked for a withdrawal of North Vietnamese forces. And therefore, we could not agree with our allies in South Vietnam. When they added conditions to the established positions after an agreement had been reached that reflected these established positions. And as was made clear in the press conference here on October 26, as the President has reiterated in his speeches, the United States will not continue the war one day longer than it believes is necessary to reach an agreement we consider just and fair. So we want to leave no doubt about the fact that if an agreement is reached that meets the stated conditions of the President, if an agreement is reached that we consider just that no other party will have a veto over our actions. But <clears throat> I am also bound to tell you that today this question is moot because we have not yet reached an agreement that the President considers just and fair. And therefore, I want to explain to you the process of the negotiations since they resumed on November 20th and <coughs> where we are. <coughs> the three objectives that we were seeking in these negotiations were stated in the press conference of October 26th in many speeches by the President afterwards and in every communication to Hanoi since. They could not have been a surprise. Now let me say a word first about what were called linguistic difficulties, and which were called these in order not to inflame the situation. How did they arise? They arose because the North Vietnamese presented us a document in English, which we then discussed with them. And in many places throughout this document, the original wording was changed as the negotiations proceeded. And the uh, phrases were frequently weakened compared to the original formulation. It was not until we received the Vietnamese text after those negotiations were concluded that we found that while the English terms had been changed, the Vietnamese terms had been left unchanged. And so we suddenly found ourselves engaged in two negotiations one about the English text, the other about the Vietnamese text. Having conducted many negotiations, I must say this was a novel procedure. <laughs> and it led to the view that perhaps these were not simply linguistic difficulties, but substantive difficulties. Now, I must say that all of these, except one, have now been eliminated. The second category of problems concerned bringing into being the international machinery so that it could operate simultaneously with the uh, ceasefire, and so as to avoid a situation where the ceasefire, rather than bring peace, 
would unleash another frenzy of warfare. To that end, we submitted on November 20th, the first day that the negotiations resumed, a list of what are called protocols, <coughs> technical instruments to bring this machinery into being. <clears throat> These protocols, <coughs> I will not go into the details of these protocols, and they are normally <coughs> technical documents, and ours were certainly intended to conform to normal practice. Despite the fact that this occurred four weeks after we had made clear <coughs> that this was our intention, and three weeks after <coughs> Hanoi had pressed us to sign a ceasefire agreement, the North Vietnamese refused to discuss our protocol and refused to give us their protocol so that the question of bringing the international machinery into being could not be addressed. The first time we saw the North Vietnamese protocols was on December, the evening of December 12th, the night before I was supposed to leave uh, Paris, six weeks after we had stated what our aim was, five weeks after the ceasefire was supposed to be signed, a ceasefire which called for these, this machinery to be set up immediately. <coughs> these protocols reopened, were not technical instruments, but reopened a whole list of issues that had been settled, or we thought had been settled, in the agreement. They contained provisions that were not in the original agreement, and they excluded provisions that were in the original agreement. They are now in the process of being discussed by the technical experts in uh, Paris, but some effort will be needed to remove the political provisions from them and to return them to a technical status. Secondly, I think it is safe to say <laughs> that the North Vietnamese perception of international machinery and our perception of international machinery is at drastic variance. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an understatement. <coughs> we had thought that an effective machinery required, <coughs> in effect, some freedom of movement. <laughs> and a num and our estimate was that several thousand people were needed to monitor the many provisions of the agreement. The North Vietnamese perception is that the total force should be no more than 250, of which nearly half should be located at headquarters, that it would be dependent for its communication, logistics, and even physical necessities entirely on the party in whose area it was located. So it would have no jeeps, no telephones, no radio, of its own, that it could not move without being accompanied by liaison officers of <coughs> the party that was to be investigated if that party decided to give it the jeeps to get to where the violation was taking place 
and if that party would then let it communicate what it found. It is our impression that the members of this commission will not exhaust themselves in frenzies of activity if this, uh, if this procedure were adopted. <coughs> now, thirdly, the substance of the agreement. <coughs> the negotiations since November 20th really have taken place in two phases. The first phase, which lasted for three days, continued the spirit and the attitude of the meetings in October. We presented our proposals. Some were accepted, others were rejected. But by the end of the third day, we had made very substantial progress. And we thought, all of us thought, that we were within a day or two of completing the arrangements. We do not know what decisions were made in Hanoi at that point. But from that point on, the negotiations have had the character where a settlement was always just within our reach and was always pulled just beyond our reach when we attempted to grasp it. <clears throat> I do not think it is proper for me to go into the details of the specific issues, but I think I should give you a general atmosphere and a general sense of the procedures that were followed. When we returned on December 4th, we were, we of the American team, thought that the meetings could not last more than two or three days because there were only two or three issues left to be resolved. You all know that the meetings lasted nine days. They began with Hanoi withdrawing every change that had been agreed to two weeks previously. We then spent the rest of the week getting back to where we had already been two weeks before. And by Saturday, we thought we had narrowed the issue sufficiently, where if the other side had accepted again one section that they had already agreed to two weeks previously, <coughs> the agreement could have been completed. At that point, the president ordered General Haig to return to Washington so that he would be available for the mission that would then follow of presenting the agreement to our allies. <clears throat> At that point, we thought we were sufficiently close so that experts could meet to conform the text so that we would not again encounter the linguistic difficulties which we had experienced previously and so that we could make sure that the changes that had been negotiated in English would also be reflected in Vietnamese. <clears throat> when the experts met, they were presented with 17 new changes in the guise of linguistic changes. <clears throat> when I met again with the special advisor, the one problem which we thought remained on Saturday had grown to two, and a new demand was presented. When we accepted that, it was withdrawn the next day and sharpened up.
So we spend our time going through the 17 linguistic changes and reduce them again to two. So then on the last day of the meeting, we asked our experts to me to compare whether the 15 changes that had been settled of the 17 that had been proposed, whether those now conformed in the two texts. At that point, we were presented with 16 new changes, <coughs> including four substantive ones, some of which now still remain unsettled. Now, I will not go into the details or into the merits of these changes. The major difficulty that we now face is that provisions that were settled in the agreement appear again in a different form in the protocol. That matters of technical implementation, which were implicit in the agreement from the beginning, have not been uh, addressed and were not presented to us until the very last day of a series of sessions that had been specifically designed to discuss them. And that as soon as one issue was settled, a new issue was raised. It was very tempting for us to continue the process, which is <clears throat> so close to everybody's heart, <clears throat> implicit in the many meetings of indicating uh, great progress. But the president decided that we could not engage in a charade with the American people. And we are now in this curious position. Great progress has been made, even in the talks. The only thing that is lacking is one decision in Hanoi to settle the remaining issues in terms that two weeks previously they had already agreed to. So we are not talking of an issue of principle that is totally unacceptable. And secondly, to complete the work that is required to bring the international machinery into being <clears throat> in the spirit that both sides have an interest of not ending the war in such a way that it is just the beginning of another round of conflict. So we are in a position where peace can be near, but peace requires a decision. <coughs> and this is why we wanted to restate once more what our basic attitude is. With respect to Saigon, we have sympathy and compassion for the anguish of their people and for the concerns of their government. But if we can get an agreement that the president considers just, we will proceed with it. <clears throat> with respect to Hanoi, our basic objective was stated in the press conference of October 26. We want an end of the war that is something more than an armistice. We want to move from hostility to normalization and from normalization to cooperation. 
but we will not make a settlement, which is a disguised form of continued warfare, and which <laughs> brings about by indirection what we have <clears throat> always said we would not tolerate. We <clears throat> have not, we have always stated that a fair solution cannot possibly give either side everything that it wants. <clears throat> we have, we are not continuing a war in order to give total victory to our allies. We want to give them a reasonable opportunity to participate in a political struggle. But we also will not make a settlement which is a disguised form of victory for the other side. <clears throat> Therefore, we are at a point where we are again, perhaps we are closer to an agreement than we were at the end of October if the other side is willing to deal with us in good faith and with goodwill. But it cannot do that every day an issue is settled, a new one is raised that when an issue is settled in an agreement, it is raised again as an understanding. And if it is settled in an understanding, it is raised again as a protocol. We will not be blackmailed into an agreement. I don't want to speculate on, uh, on Hanoi's motives, and I have no doubt that before too long we will hear a version of events that does not exactly coincide with ours. Uh, I have attempted to give you as honest an account as I'm capable of. I believe, and this is pure speculation, that for a people that have fought for, for so long, it is paradoxically perhaps easier to face the risks of war than the uncertainties of peace. And it may be that they're waiting for a further accentuation of the divisions between us and Saigon, for more public pressures on us or perhaps they simply cannot make up their minds. But I really have no clue to what the, uh, uh, what the policy decisions were. Dr. Kissinger, Dr. Kissinger. Uh, from your account, uh, one could conclude that the talks are now ended in, in terms of uh, the series you completed. Uh, is that true? And secondly, if it is not true, under, on what basis will they be resumed? Uh, should I repeat the question? Uh, the question is, can one assume from my account that the talks are now completed, and on what basis can they be resumed? We do not consider the talks completed. We believe that it would be a relatively simple matter to conclude the agreement, because many of the issues that I mentioned in the press conference on, of October 26, have either been settled or substantial progress towards settling them has been made. <clears throat> Therefore, if there were a determination to reach an agreement, it could be reached uh, relatively quickly. On the other hand, uh, the possibilities of raising uh, technical objections is endless. <coughs> so if uh, uh, we have, uh, as uh, uh, Ledoc Toe said yesterday, we would 
uh, remain in contact through messages. <coughs> we uh, can then decide whether or when to meet again. I expect that we will meet again. But we have to meet in an atmosphere that is worthy of the seriousness of the endeavor. And on that basis, as far as we are concerned, the settlement will be very rapid. Murray. You have not discussed at all the proposals that each ending existing agreement that is negotiated. <coughs> Can you discuss what those were and what effect they had on stimulating the more if they did to making further proposals at this point? Uh, the question is, uh, could I describe the proposals we made on behalf of Hanoi of Saigon, which may have stimulated Hanoi into, uh, into making uh, counter-proposals? As I pointed out, there were two categories of objections on the part of Saigon. Uh, objections which we agreed with, and objections which we didn't agree with. <coughs> the objections that we agreed with are essentially contained in the list that I presented at the beginning. And those were the ones we maintained. Uh, <coughs> all of those, we believe, did not represent changes in the agreement, but either clarifications removal of ambiguities, or spelling out the implementation of agreed uh, positions. <clears throat> In the first sequence of meetings between November 20th and November 26th, most of those were, or many of those, were taken care of. So that we have literally as I have pointed out before, been in the position where every day we thought it could and indeed almost had to be the last day. The counter proposals that Hanoi has made were again in two categories. One set of changes that would have totally destroyed the balance of the agreement and which in effect withdrew the most significant concessions they had made. I did not mention those in my statement because in the process of negotiation, they tended to disappear. Uh, they tended to disappear from the agreement to reappear in understandings, and then to disappear from understandings to reappear in protocols. But I suspect that they will, in time, after the nervous exhaustion of our technical experts disappear from the protocols as well. So the major counter-proposals, uh, which were, uh, we believe, can be handled. But then there were a whole series of technical counter-proposals, which were absolutely unending, and which hinged on such profound questions whether, if you state an obligation in the future tense, you were therefore leaving open the question when it would come into operation and whether you and and matters uh, that reached the metaphysical at moments and which as soon as one of them was settled another one appeared and which made one believe that one was not engaged in an effort to settle fundamental issues but in a uh, delaying action for whatever reason now those issues can be settled any day that somebody decides to be serious. <clears throat> now, it is clear that the interplay between Saigon and Hanoi is one of the complicating features of this negotiation. But the basic point that <clears throat> we want to make here is this. <clears throat> we have had our difficulties in Saigon. But the obstacle to an agreement at this moment is not Saigon. 
because we do not have as yet an agreement that we can present to them. <clears throat> when that point is reached, we have made clear that the president has made clear that he will act on the basis of <clears throat> what he considers just. But he has also made clear that he does not want to end such a long war by bringing about a very short peace. Uh, 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 <coughs> made operative without Saigon signature? <clears throat> well, uh, this is a question that has not yet had to be faced, uh, but, uh, and which we hope will not have to be faced. Dr. Kister, for the agreement to be just... Uh, According to the President's terms, must there be substantial withdrawal of North Vietnamese troops from the South? The question is whether the uh, agreement to be just uh, must involve a substantial withdrawal or, of North Vietnamese forces from the South. The question of North Vietnamese forces in the South has two elements. Uh, the presence of the forces now there, well, it has three elements. The presence of the forces now there, their future, and the general claim that North Vietnam may make with respect to its right to intervene constantly in the South. With respect to the last question, we cannot accept the proposition that North Vietnam has a right of constant intervention in the South. With respect to the first question of the forces now in the South, the United States has made three ceasefire proposals since October 1970, all of them based on the de facto situation as it existed at the time of the ceasefire all of them approved by the government of South Vietnam. And therefore, we did not add that condition of withdrawal to our present proposal, which reflected exactly the positions we had taken on January 25th and on May 8th of this year, both of which had been agreed to by the government of the Republic of Vietnam. Now, we believe, however, that if the agreement that has been negotiated is implemented in good faith, that the problem of the forces will tend to lose its significance, or at least reduce significance, partly because of de facto withdrawals that could occur, and partly because if the provisions with respect to Laos, Cambodia, and no infiltration are maintained, the consequences in attrition will have to be, uh, will have to be obvious. Are we back to square one now, Dr. Kissinger, no. would you say? Uh, the question is, are we back to square one? No. We have an agreement that is 99% com completed as far as the text of the agreement is concerned. We also have an agreement whose uh, associated implementations are very simple to conclude if one, sim if one takes the basic provisions of international supervision that are in the text of the agreement, provisions that happen to be spelled out in greater detail in the agreement than almost any, than any other aspect. And therefore, we are one decision away from a settlement. And Hanoi can settle this any day by an exchange of messages after which there would be required uh, a certain amount of work on the agreement, which is not very much, and some work in bringing the uh, implementing instruments into being. What that one percent is? Well, you know, I, I have found that I get into trouble when I give figures. 
Uh, what I, uh, so let me not insist on 1%. It is an agreement that is substantially uh, completed, but I cannot go into, uh, into that. But that, in any event, is not the, uh, that I alone is not, a, is, is not the problem. The problem is, as I've described it in, uh, in my presentation. Marvin? As to whether what remains you would describe as fundamental or one of these technical problems, because you've ranged between the two, and I'm a little lost as to what is left. No, the, the, the technical implementing instruments that they have presented are totally unacceptable for the reasons which I gave. Uh, on the other hand, I cannot really believe that they are serious. Uh, what remains on the agreement itself is a fundamental point. It is, however, a point that had been accepted already two weeks previously and later withdrawn. So we are not raising a new fundamental point. We are raising the acceptance of something that had already once been accepted. I really don't want to go into uh, what's the future of the Paris peace talks. Uh, I think that the uh, sort of discussions that have been going on, on the Paris, in the Paris peace talks are not affected by such temporary ups and downs as the private peace talks. So I'm sure that, that Minister Xuantui and Ambassador Porter will find many subjects for mutual recrimination. Dr. We have time for we have time for just a few more questions. First George over here. Uh, isn't the fundamental point the, the one you raised about the right of North Vietnamese forces to intervene in the future in South Vietnam? I will not go into the substance of the negotiation. Dr. Kiss, Cliff, you already have Cliff, raised Cliff, a we'll fundamental come we'll disagreement come in which you say that uh, the, it is the U.S. insistence that the two parts of Vietnam should live in peace with each other. Is that not the fundamental disagreement here? Uh, as I said, I will not go into the details, but the question is, isn't it a fundamental issue when we say that the two parts of Vietnam should live in peace with one another? I can't consider it an extremely onerous demand to say that the parties of a peace settlement should live in peace with another, one another, and we cannot make a settlement which brings peace to North Vietnam and maintains the war in South Vietnam. That Vietnam is one country and that this peace agreement is supposed to ratify that point. Uh, the question is whether their position isn't that Vietnam is one country and that this agreement is supposed to ratify that point. Uh, as I said, I will not go into the substance of the discussions, and I repeat that the issue that remained when we sent General Haig home is one that had already been agreed upon once, so it was not, it could not have been something that happened by oversight. Would this be the final question? Uh, Henry has to uh, leave now. Go ahead. I was wondering how he would conclude that. Uh, <laughs> I know I messaged ahead of time that you would talk to us. I beg your pardon? I know I messaged ahead of time that you would talk to us. No. The question is, did we tell Hanoi ahead of time that we would talk to you? And the answer to that is no, but I suspect you will get that message to them very quickly. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, conclude, we'll conclude with one, one final question, and then we'll take yours, Bill, and that'll be it. Okay, Bill. Is there any understanding in Paris before you left that each side would be free to express itself without uh, damaging the possibility of future talks? No. Uh, Lee Ducto correctly stated our agreement at the airport, that we would not go into the substance of the talks. Now, I recognize that what I'm doing here uh, goes to the edge of that understanding. <laughs> but uh, the president felt that we could not permit a situation to continue in which there was daily speculation 
as to something that was already uh, accomplished, while the record was so clearly contrary, and uh, therefore we owed you an explanation, not of the particular uh, issues, but of the uh, of the progress of negotiations and exactly where they stood. Okay, this will be the final uh, question, uh, George. I have quite clear and technical point. You talked about <laughs> agreement understandings and protocols. Are there, in fact, three different sets of, of documents under negotiation? What are these understandings? <laughs> Uh, the question is, what are those understandings? No, three different sets of them. Yeah, they're agreement understandings and protocols. It always happens in a negotiation that there's some discussion which is not part of the agreement which attempts to explain what specific provisions mean and how they're going to be interpreted. And this is what I meant by understandings. The protocols are the instruments that bring into being the international machinery uh, uh, and and prisoner release, and their function is usually, uh, in fact, always, uh, a purely technical implementation of provisions of an agreement. These protocols do not, as a, as a general rule, raise new issues, but rather they say, for example, with respect to prisoners, if the prisoners are to be released in 60 days, they would spell out the staging the points at which they are released, who can receive them, uh, and so forth. Similarly, with respect to international machinery, they would say, where are the teams located, what are their, what are their functions, and so forth. Our concern is that the protocols, as we now have them, raise both political issues, which are inappropriate to implementing protocols, and technical issues which are inconsistent with uh, international supervision. We have other protocols that deal with, with prisoners and withdrawals and mining, uh, 